Hi, I'm Frank Mezzaferro and my partner is Rachel Lacido. And today I will be conducting an oral interview of Mr. Varner at Rome Free Academy on January 7th, uh, 2002. All right, we'll get right started. Um, what year were you born, Mr. Varner? 1925. 1925. January 17th, 1925. Where were you born? Lawrenceville, Illinois. Did you stay there in uh, Illinois the whole time, or did you move uh, it off? Until I graduated out of high school. And then where did you go from there? Uh, I went into the Navy. You did? Yeah. Okay. Um, what year did you enter the Navy? I signed up in December of 42, and because of two bad teeth, I had to get filled. I went in January 43. January 43? So um, you enlisted. You weren't... Uh, no, I was not drafted. You weren't drafted? I was 17 years old. 17 years old? Mm-hmm. What made you decide to go into the Navy? Well, <clears throat> between the services, I figured the Navy would give me three square meals a day and a, and a shower at night. <laughs> instead of, you know, in box holes and all that. So, I kind of liked the Navy anyway, the bell bottom trousers and the girls and all that stuff. <laughs> Where were you during Pearl Harbor? Pearl Harbor, I was sitting in a bowling alley at home. What were your uh, feelings towards Pearl Harbor? Well, everybody was shocked. Uh, unbelievable, just just like the uh, September 11 deal. It, uh, you know, with, with the, the Japanese uh, ambassador in uh, Washington, D.C., and, and, and it happens. Uh, and we'll no, we were all shocked. When you first joined the Navy, where were you assigned to? I was in boot camp in Great Lakes, Illinois. What was the boot camp like? Very cold and very tough. Um, what were some of the duties that you had to do while you were in boot camp? Well, in boot camp you gotta, of course, take care of your own personal, your watch. You gotta stand watch, uh, uh, armed guard watch on the gates. Um, they they put you through even though it's cold. I, I was lucky that uh, it was cold because otherwise they'd have me out there on. Uh, Lake Michigan and uh, a sailboat, you know, just uh, lessons on boats. But uh, it was mostly just uh, the basic uh, uh, Navy terms and what to expect in the Navy, uh, uh, the drilling and the, the uh, rifle uh, range. And uh, it was for 13 weeks. Uh, and, and uh, the old chief officer also we had it was pretty tough. He wiped that smile off your face, and you know, you hear you. Most of them were about my age, seventeen. So what the heck do we know? How long were you in boot camp? Thirteen. Thirteen weeks. weeks. After a boot camp, where were you? They put us on a train at midnight out of uh, Great Lakes, Illinois. <laughs> we didn't know where we were going. They didn't tell us, and we ended up in the Philadelphia Navy Yard. In the where? Philadelphia Navy Yard. What did you guys do in the Philadelphia Navy Yard? There's where the ship uh, was, well, the ship was being uh, built in Camden. Uh, but there's where we were going to stay until we could board the ship after commissioning. What was the first ship you were assigned to? USS Calpins. i tell you one thing that we, we learned in boot camp is you take your mattress and hammock with you. Even though you don't use a hammock, but <clears throat> the thing of it is you take your mattress and, and um, you uh, roll your mattress in the hammock and uh, then you uh, put your sea bag in there and then you tie it. Then you got to have what they call a ditty bag with your personal items in it. You carry that, throw it over your shoulder and you're gone. Now, when you get to Philadelphia Navy Yard, they run you through the gas chamber. And then you got to scrub that hammock and turn it in. You never use it. What was the gas chamber? The g gas chamber is to get you used to uh, gas. Uh, uh, you know, in, in case uh, you're ever on the field or, or uh, in any place where there might be a gas uh, charge. And, and we used to go into the chamber, put your gas mask on, go into the chamber, then they would blow away, so you yank your gas mask off and run out. 
with your eyes tearing and mouth burning. Did you guys uh, train for anything else while you were in the Philadelphia Navy Yard? Uh, yeah. Uh, they sent me to gunnery school over in uh, Virginia Beach. Uh, 40 millimeter guns. Uh, then, well, after they started putting us on board, they they assigned us to the compartments. You know, the first division, second division, third division. Well, what really burned me up was I'll go back a little bit. When I got out of boot camp, they gave me my orders and my record, and they stamped a qualified submarine duty. And I, oh no, not that. Why didn't you want to be on submarine duty? Oh, because. At least on board ship, you got a chance. Nine times out of ten on a sub, you don't have a chance because you're down below. But uh, so then uh, I got assigned to the first division, actually, because I'm uh, come out of boot camp as a second class seaman. And that's about all I'm good for is scrubbing down the decks and wiping off the guns and uh, deck division, they call it. And then uh, uh, you got to take an exam for first class seaman. And that goes into third class, which I uh, ended up as a third class uh, storekeeper on board ship. They had assigned me that. And when I went aboard ship and it got underway, uh, I was in the first division way up in the uh, forward end of the ship. And uh, I worked in the uh, dispersing office. Also, the clothing store and the ship store where you buy you candy and gum and, and razor blades and combs and stuff like that. So that was your general duties on the uh, Kyle Pins, the boat that you were on? Yeah. What did you receive the 12 Battle Stars for? The what? The 12 Battle Stars. That was uh, in the islands. In the islands? Which island? Uh, starting a week on all of them. Huh. Uh, Marshalls, Gilberts, uh, Hollandia, New Guinea, uh, Philippines, the uh, truck, uh, Pal Palau, uh, Formosa, all of them. Did you stay on uh, the Cowpens, the boat, the whole time, or yes. you did? Well, when did you guys first arrive to Wake Island? 1943, I think it is. Here's the history of the Cowpens. November 41. Uh, oh, I can tell you that there was nine of these. They, they were going to be cruisers, but the Navy seen that uh, they needed aircraft carriers more because of the few aircraft carriers they had at the time of Pearl Harbor. So they converted these cruisers into aircraft carriers, and that's why it was a CVL. What's a CVL? Uh, aircraft carrier light, small. <clears throat> this ship uh, displaced 11,000 tons of water, 610 feet, 6 inches long, had a beam across the front, uh, back, 31 uh, feet, 6 inches, 33 knots, and when they done 33 knots, everything vibrated. Uh, I can say that the Calvins was named after usually those ships or aircraft carriers were named after great battles that the uh, America was involved in, and this was USS Calvins, Calvins, South Carolina, and it um, was was a, a major Revolutionary War win, which ended the Revolutionary War, and they they they. Uh, teach us about this ship in their school, and they got the original flag off the ship hanging yeah. in the classroom. So in, what was it like uh, battle, at the Battle of Wake Island? Wake Island, I mean, I've got in here how many, uh, Wake Island was, was that was uh, uh, more or less a, a practice run for us, mm -hmm. because Midway was, and then Wake, they're in line, and uh, that was more or less a practice run for us, which uh, w uh, our, our planes, of course, were involved. But uh, as for me, I had a, a, a general quarter station below deck center repair party, which is, you know, very scary because the guy says the torpedo is heading our way and uh, 
they hissed us, and we got to figure out a way of plugging up the hole or whatever damage it did. But uh, let, let me see. Uh, Yeah, we uh, took a shakedown cruise at uh, Port of French. We, it, 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 it was one of the lesser, even though there was uh, plane, a, a Japanese bear, what the U.S. was going to do was uh, Midway was the big one, and they were like going for a bigger prize down in uh, uh, Macon and Millie, uh, the uh, Marshall Islands, the Gilbert Islands, uh, uh, Marianas. They, uh, they, because the ship was uh, USS Calvin, they called it the Mighty Moon, and they had a rare and bull painted on the bridge with all of the, uh, 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 what can I say, uh, when uh, we made a hit or shot down a plane, they put it up on the bridge. Uh, I was trying to find about that uh, week on, but uh, it was one of the lesser ones because uh, we that was a practice run for us. Mm -hmm. Which island do you think was the worst to go to, have to go to? Uh, well, the Philippines, Lady Gulf, Mindanao, we were uh, refueling off the Philippines in December 44. There was a typhoon approaching and all the admirals got word that it was a big one and they never did anything about it. And so the uh, tanker hooked up with us and they was pumping oil to us. And we went right into the eye of the typhoon. Uh -huh. And so, naturally, the tanker immediately broke loose. Or they didn't break loose, they, they uh, got, got away from us. And then, now an aircraft carrier is top heavy. I sat down in Combat Information Center and I watched that bubble roll over 45 degrees. <coughs> the two destroyers around us capsized. Now, during general quarters or refueling, all the watertight doors and hatches are closed, the air conditioning is turned off, so those poor guys, they wouldn't many got out of there, because, you know, they were all, everything was shut and turned off. Uh, and uh, as I've been reading, it was uh, one of the Navy's biggest blunders. Ed Mahalzi almost lost his job on account of going right into the eye of it. And then we went on up into uh, Lady Gulf, which was another bad one because uh, we almost came in uh, shooting distance uh, of the Japanese fleet. But the, the worst one for us was, I think, in Formosa, when uh, the kamikazes were coming out. And we were in, see, we traveled in the third, third fleet and the fifth fleet, the same thing, same ships, only different areas, and they call it third and fifth, and uh, off of Formosa, uh, the USS Houston got torpedoed twice, and the USS Canberra got torpedoed, and the Houston, they told them to abandon ship, but then as they abandoned ship, the destroyers come by to pick them up, and some of the guys got caught. Did you guys have any other close calls besides the... Well, yeah, uh, because... They gave us the escort duty to escort those two uh, lame ducks back into the, the island configuration of Ulithi. It's where the fleet came back into to get repaired and supplies or whatever they needed. And the Japs knew they had a lame duck. They knew it. They wanted to sink it. And so all night long, they would leave one of their airplanes here. The rest would fly back and load up and come out. They'd know exactly where we were. All night long, they were trying to sink us, plus that Houston, and they never got to it. They brought the USS Houston all the way back into the Brooklyn Navy Yard. 
what were some of the duties you performed while you were uh, at the islands at the Philippines? Uh, well, I uh, my uh, best uh, biggest job was uh, dispersing storekeeper, whereby I typed up the uh, payroll, and I helped the uh, finance officer, the lieutenant JG, uh, in in the payday, you know, to get, to get the thumbprints and and. Uh, then I had to make sure that the payroll was right because there were some guys on the ship that was uh, good poker players and they never drew any money. And, and uh, then uh, in between times I would uh, run the clothing store, especially after a payday because the guys still bought uh, clothes. Uh, and uh, the, the ship store is where they bought their cigarettes and their uh, uh, shaving cream and, and uh, candy and pens and combs. So I run that also. And in between we had uh, field days where everybody went to work and scrubbed this and scrubbed that and then the, the old man would come through and the captain and, and uh, inspect and give us a stamp or give us, chew us out. <laughs> Did you have to use any um, weapons at all during the war? Uh, not me personally, because after I got out of it, I, w I was uh, uh, on the 40 millimeter mount on the forecastle, the front of the ship, and uh, it had two 40 millimeter guns. It, all we did was load those things. They had a fire control up above us that swung that thing around and fired it. And uh, of course, we had two guys up there loading the clips, and then they had uh, several of us back handing the clip of 40 millimeter rounds, which is about that long, about that big around, up and they feed it into the uh, gun, and then the fire control would. So I was standing there, and kaboom, here comes in. the bell on the end of the gun, caught me right there on the ear. Still wow, it was the, you got in, so you got some injuries while you were there? Well. Did you get anything besides that, or no? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that was there. And then after that, I got out of the uh, deck division, I got an S division supply, which Supply takes in the, the uh, galleys, uh, the food, uh, the stores, all, all uh, anything that has to be ordered, materials, it, it, you run through supply and, and uh, the uh, dispersing. And I got into that uh, pretty heavy, and uh, which was good because I knew everybody in the bake shop, I could get most anything down there. In the galley, I could go down and get a cup of coffee or a sandwich to any time I wanted. Um, what were your offers, officers like in the Navy? We had uh, very good officers. Uh, the, we had an uh, uh, executive officer, they called the Burden. He'd go like this. When he wanted to, he'd go. That's why we call him the Bird. The uh, skipper was great. Uh, my division. Uh, Lieutenant, uh, we spent some time in the Philadelphia Navy Yard, and of course he had a girlfriend there, and uh, I used to get around a little bit. And we used to correspond, uh, get the Philadelphia newspaper, and something for us to talk about. Uh, you got to understand now that when the ship gets underway. And you could no longer see green trees or anything that looked like an island. Your stomach just go, oh my God, not again. Because you know you're going to be there at least three months. How long were you on the, uh, on the ship? I was on there. I got off in uh, 45. What were some of the medals you received, or received for your services? Well, no, number one, which was late, is a good conduct medal. <laughs> and uh, Asiatic Pacific... Uh, was uh, twelve uh, two gold stars are worth five uh, five stars each uh, battle. So that's twelve battles on the Asiatic Pacific, the uh, Philippine Liberation with two stars, um, uh, the uh, Presidential Unit Citation. Uh, let's see what maybe it's one here. During the uh, Calpins, uh, the Navy Unit of Commentation, American Campaign Medal, Asia, that Pacific Medal was 11 Battle Stars, World War II Victory Medal, Navy Occupational Medal, Philippine Liberation Ribbon with two Bronze Stars, 
The Republic of Philippines Prison and Unit Citation also received what is an anti submarine net metal. Anti submarine net metal, that was a lap. On the, on the way down to uh, Panama, or to go through the Panama Canal, we were going to pull into the Norfolk Navy Yard for something. And all the Navy Yards around, they got this uh, submarine net. It, it's a uh, heavy cable and it's made in uh, squares and uh, so no submarine could get in there. We got hung up in it, our shoes. <laughs> and they had to put us in dry dock uh, to untangle that and, and make sure that they were working properly before we could go on down through the canal. You talked a little bit about um, having to bury your mates at sea. What was that like? It was tough. Marines are not the easiest people to get along with. It's okay, take your time. But I did. And then we were uh, I, uh, uh, engaging the Japanese fleet. It was so far away that our planes didn't have enough gas to get back. They told them to land on any ship that you could see. <coughs> they wanted to turn on the lights, but they couldn't do it at night. That would have been suicide. So they told them to land on any ship. They would land on our ship and we'd push them over the side and make room for more. Wow. These Marines were in the twin. <laughs> Do you want something, some water or something? That was 60 years ago. But anyway, this plane, the boatman from our ship, he landed and went over the side and put their heads off. And, you know, being in, in a war zone and, and in a war, the only thing we could do was bury them at sea. And then I understand now that they uh, uh, make a map and uh, the parents or whoever, families of uh, those, uh, would get a location of where the body went down. But uh, they do it different now. You know, they uh, just spread the ashes if you want to. But back in those days, uh, we had no refrigeration to keep a body, and it had to, in the war zone, it had to go. What was it like working uh, in the repair deck? In, in the what? The repair deck, or the repair party in the blow deck. Oh, you sit down there and sweat it out, and, and uh, they got the PA system turned on, and they'll say, well, uh, here comes the torpedo, and it looks like it's going to hit the at the end of the fan tail. And you're just sitting there, what am I, here we are, we can't breathe, we're sweating, and they tell us the torpedo's heading our way. And then we get Tokyo Rose on the radio, well, the USS Calpin's got bombed today. Don't you guys wish that you were home in front of the fireplace? Do you want to talk about some of the materials that you brought in? Uh, <coughs> she was born in the United States and went to school in California. The uh, shakedown crew, here's a, we had, um, here you want to hold that so the camera can see it. There we go. Oh, we're getting some glare. 
Huh? We'll take pictures of it afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, well, I hope you cut that place out while we're on crying. We will. Right? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry for a grown man crying, though. I can't do it. I just... That's all right. We've had, we understand that it's, it's a tough We situation. had, um, um, it seems like uh, every battle we went into, uh, you know, uh, well, I can tell you one joyful time was when we crossed the equator for, for the first time. And uh, you're a polywag until you uh, get the initiation. And here it was, uh, uh, we had this one old uh, uh, little Japanese airplane that used to fly over at the same time every day, and they call it, uh, what the heck did they have a name for him? But anyway, we were out there on the flight deck, and they were making us polywags to go through the garbage chute and kiss a royal, uh, what you call it, our, uh, belly, big fat guy with grease all over his belly. Kiss the royal, uh, what the heck they call him, baby, and then uh, go on down through, and, and then they give us, a, they had a uh, a charge that uh, chow hounds eating too much food and stuff like that. Guilty, you got to go through. And we were in the battle zone at the time, but that was important. And we had officers, we had what they call 90 day wonders. They were college graduates, and they come into the Navy with a little training. They gave him a, a ensign rating, and they put him on board ship. And uh, then we got uh, uh, a certificate that said that uh, we are now a shellback. Okay. Then we went across the international date line, and the uh, at, the, at the same time, that was a, a Golden Dragon certificate you got. But, uh, you know, uh, it, it, we, it, our ship was so darn busy that those tankers would bring us out the oil and mail and we'd give them ice cream. We had a, what we call a heat-up stand where they make ice cream. We had a barber. And, and this was uh, a real small ship. I seen, uh, and it was in uh, Look Magazine, my mother sent me a picture of one of our planes, F-6S, coming in for a landing, totally on fire. And uh, the pilot, showed the pilot getting out of the cockpit and running off the wing and jumping off. And the story was how quick that air, the uh, flight crew uh, put that fire out on the uh, that came in for a landing. Uh, in the typhoon, uh, they had a, a it, it blew, we got these jeeps on, on the flight deck to you, you, uh, pull the airplanes around there. They went over the side. Uh, we, there was a fire on the aft end of the flight deck and the uh, engineering officer went up and investigated and he got blown over the side. We never found him again. Um, but once in a while, in a law, they would pass swim call. Everything was by bugle. And, and they would have the Marines there with their uh, rifles uh, in, in case any sharks would come around us. And then uh, one time, yeah, we were a swim call and a couple of guys wandered a couple of little islands and they didn't think the current was that strong in between. They, they never came back. But uh, the, the ship was, for uh, 22 months, it was continually gone, except, well, when we got down to Pearl Harbor, the um, ships lay just as they got sunk, and we always uh, stood at attention when we passed the Arizona, and we got more supplies. We went on a night problem uh, to get our pilots used to night flying. Now, can you imagine the carriers you see today, and look what our pilots had to land on. Looks like a little postage stamp from up there. And uh, then after that, we started, we hit Wake Island and down through the Marshalls and Gilberts and truck and, and 
the Hollandia, New Guinea, and the Philippines, and but uh, I seen so many airplanes come back that was shot, shot up, you know, the wing was shot, the tail was shot. He still brought it in. Uh, there's a picture in here of one that went through the barrier. It, it didn't catch the cable, and uh, one time the cable. Oh wow! Yeah. They tore that to pieces. Went through the barrier. See, they didn't catch the cable. When uh, you got a guy on the aft end of the flight deck, and he's he's got flags, and he's telling these pilots like this. Get your wing down and get your wing down, and then he'll go like this, and then he'll land. And then that hook will pick up that cable and stretch it all the way out. But then they have a barrier down on the end. And that's what the cable, it was probably too bad shot up. It, it, that's the, we had them run into the superstructure uh, because they were lucky to get the plane back. But, uh, that's for for a, a ship, that, a converted cruiser, we had everything on board that ship. And, and uh, they take the plane, they had two elevators, and take the planes down on the hangar deck to work on them. But uh, uh, a lot of times we had to eat standing up and eat sandwiches because it was so rough, the water. But the one thing about the water out there, it's nice, clear, greenish, blue. And talk about flying fishes, they are flying fishes. Maybe a little fish should fly. <laughs> what were some of the other things you brought with you? <clears throat> oh, uh, this is the first U.S. carrier in the South China Sea. First U.S. carrier in Tokyo Bay. First U.S. planes to land on Japanese soil. We went up past going into Tokyo. I, I got a ship before then. <clears throat> and uh, we were in uh, Ulithia and it came up for <coughs> transfer for one storekeeper. And there were three of us eligible, so the guy said, well, we're going to draw cards. I got a king of clubs. I got it. He said, I'm going to keep you on board. Then yeah, I'm going over to the side right now and not coming back. So what I didn't know was the, I transferred from there to a, a, a troop transport. And from that, that troop transport sat there. Every day we'd load up in a boat and go over in the mail barge and start mailing. And then you never seen so much mail. And that, that, my ship went out and came back in again and I'm sitting there on that troop transport. And then uh, got underway finally. They said we're coming into LA or San Diego and we got off in Seattle. And then back in those days, the, I, I took a train from Seattle to uh, Chicago, and the, uh, you go to sleep in one of those uh, passengers, you wake up and you're full of cinders. And then they had the old pot belly stove in the corner, and going through the state of Washington, it's kind of cold. Then I uh, had the opportunity of reporting to any shipper station in the United States that I wanted to for a further assignment. I reported back to the Philadelphia Navy Yard. They immediately sent me to Brooklyn Navy Yard to go aboard the USS Houston, which we escorted back uh, from uh, Formosa to Ulithi to get repaired. And so they brought that ship all the way back to the Philadelphia Navy Yard. There it was. Um, when were you discharged from the Navy? Huh? When were you discharged from the Navy? Uh, January 26, 46. 46? 1946. What did you do after the war? I went back to my job. First off, I took what they call 5220, and it's $20 a week for 52 weeks, uh, loafing around to see, you know, what uh, the story was. And then I went back to my uh, original job, working on the only Central Railroad out in Chicago. And we had gotten married in 1945 down in New York City, so. I was still in the Navy, and uh, she wanted to come back to Rome, even though I had a good job out there and we had a nice apartment and everything. Uh, one kid was already born. She wanted to come back, so we jumped in my 1939 and it was the only came back to Rome. 
almost didn't make it. Right. Down, going over the hills in Auburn. Oh. Yeah, I went up, got halfway up the hill, and the damn thing put the brake on and started rolling backwards. <laughs> she jumped out of the car, and <coughs> I'm not running it. I said, well, I got it started and got it back up to the top of the hill. And she came back up and got in it. And that car, I used it to drive back and forth to Utica for a job that which I had. I took a brush and painted it, and everybody's laughing about it. And I, uh, the transmission went on. I went out to go to work one morning, cold and a lot of snow, wouldn't back up. So I had to go down to Copper City Scrapyard, junkyard. I bought a transmission, and I got the old motors manual out, and between me shaking and taking the old one out and putting the other one in, it worked. Is there anything else you'd like to add to your war stories that I didn't get to? Uh, well, to begin with, we um, we went from the uh, Philly Navy Yard down through the Panama Canal and the side of the ship hit the canal, and, you know, so old. And then uh, we went around to San Diego, we picked up a thousand Marines to take down to Pearl Harbor. Boy, of about six Marines. And we got down there and unloaded them, and then we uh, started on our uh, uh, to the islands. But uh, to the islands, uh, you know, uh, like you, you could look out, and uh, the Saratoga and the Enterprise was the two c carriers that was left when we got out there. Yorktown had just got sunk. And we felt real good when we seen them with us, but then we didn't see them with us. And we had battleships, uh, cruisers, and uh, destroyers with us at all times. And they would form a, like a circle around us, and, and we traveled in a, a fleet. And the aircraft carriers had all that protection. Uh, but we needed it when the kamikaze started coming in, because uh, our airplanes, uh, did what they could do, but uh, we we still had uh, uh, rapid fire from the, the ship too. What were the kamikazes like? Did you ever? Did any of them come close to hitting your ship? Or yeah, we yeah. You get to shoot them down most of the time. Or? That uh, the Great American Shootout uh, in the Marianas. There, uh, they were. Uh, it was one of those things when they, they come out to do it and they were going to do it. And uh, I think that's when the uh, bunkers all got hit. A couple of our carriers got hit. But uh, you, you could just sitting below decks and he, hearing all this, you know, and, and uh, telling us that uh, he's av coming towards us and we turned and he missed us. And, Yeah, we, uh, Great Lakes, you asked me about that. We learned what the Great Lakes Shuffle was. It was a piece of sandpaper under this shoe, a piece of sandpaper under this shoe, and sand the deck. It was a wooden deck. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to add? Or? Well, I think I pretty well. Here, here's a story that uh, was run. Uh, That was, what, three, four years ago? Oh, that's you? Yeah, that's me, and here, here's me and my wife. Oh, wow. Yeah, the date is on the top there. Uh, what date was um, that? 1993, November 7th. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's really nice. We'll take all pictures of this and scan it, so. Well, thank you very much okay. for, um, Letting us interview you, we appreciate it. Uh -huh. Well, I hope you cut out the, the crying bit and all that because I, I always do. That's hard. It's, we understand that it's hard. We've interviewed a lot of veterans so far. I still remember it. Yeah. They say it's like yesterday. Do you want to show us your uniform and other things you got?
this is your, uh, they call it the undress whites now. Before the war, this white jumper had, uh, was light blue and it had uh, dark blue stripes. And so did the uh, cuffs. But it looked so much like a Japanese uniform that uh, they took them off. This is the crow, and back in my day they had uh, right and left arm rates. Can you turn it over? Uh, 7B uh, right arm. Hash marks is represent, each one represent four years. And there, there's a pair of white pants with a belt that comes with these things. I got one at home, but uh, I don't think they, uh, there is a, a, a shirt, a white shirt, something like this that goes with it also now. This is a neckerchief. You roll it up and put it on your neck and tie it into a slip knot. Killer made, which they don't like you to wear, but hey, you have a shark in it. This is the Dixie Cup, the um, white uh, sailor's hat, which uh, everything had to be stenciled. And when you went through a boot camp, when you first went through and got your clothes, they gave you a stencil and they had a meeting to show you how to stencil. And it had to be, they, they come around and check it and make sure that you did that. We call these things Dixie Cups. <laughs> you get salty, you put it down like this. You know, after you've been out a while. If you're a boot, you've got a square like that. This is the uh, flat, uh, this used to have the name of the ship on it, and yeah, my ship was on here, and this guy didn't like my ship. Well, there was a fight, so, and, and it was too much uh, information given out to people that might want to, you know, know where that ship is and everything. So they just put U.S. Navy on it. But it's uh, also stencil. This is the uh, undressed blue jumper. My son took the dress blue. You see how everything's folded? On, uh, in, inside out and pressed, e except for um, this this one uh, front. It, 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 you, you turn it right side out again and, and put a nice piece down through there. This is uh, your uh, rating badge is still on the. Uh, Yeah, your rating badge is still on uh, those hash marks. If you was a good boy, they were you could buy gold ones. I wasn't good, I guess. I didn't get any gold ones. Can you turn it so we can see them? There we go. Huh? Gold is it? They used to have uh, deck divisions uh, with a right arm rate, and yeoman and uh, storekeepers and all that was a left arm rate. Now they got them all on the left arm. This is a watch cap which you uh, wore when you were on standing watch. You stand at four, four on and eight off. At night it got cold out there. These things here, they um, died blue when we hit the South Pacific because it's harder to see from the air, the blue one. Oh yeah. Oh, it's like they're always white. There, there is another uniform, work uniform. They call it dungarees. You call them jeans. The chambray, blue chambray shirt. But all it is is uh, the the jeans we call them dungarees, and uh, the blue chambray shirt. That was our work uniform, and the rating badge. Uh, your uh, oh, your rating badge. But this is uh, when you become a chief fighter officer or an officer. You go into the khaki uniform, shirts and pants. You put your uh, rating uh, pin on the collar.
this is a, just another uh, white uniform. I wanted to show you that everything has got to be stenciled and it's got to be stenciled in the right place. And that's about it. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>